Okay, perfect. So first of all, I'm going to answer the question, what is an API? That's the reason why you're here. We want to know what an API is. So API stands for Application Programming Interface. And essentially, in very rudimentary terms, that's an abstract way for us to communicate and interact with an object. So that, if, by reading that sentence, you might start to think, well, that has nothing to do with websites, that has nothing to do with the internet at all, or with software at all. Because APIs, their original meaning is just you interact with an object, and an object behaves in accordance with whatever input you gave that object. So let's look at some examples in the real world. Um, an elevator, you interact with those buttons on the elevator and some magic happens behind the scenes that we don't really see, but the elevator goes to whatever floor you, you press the button for. Uh, similarly, with, with a display on a phone, there's a lot of buttons. You don't know exactly what software runs when you press those buttons, but you press the button, you press the YouTube app button and it takes you to the YouTube app. Obviously, there's a lot going on, a lot of code going on behind there that allows that process to actually happen. But it's that API, that interface, that um, allows us to uh, allows the machine uh, to be able to communicate with you, and you know, uh, complete its role that that you wanted to complete. So that's what an API is in very rudimentary terms. But today we want to learn about web APIs. Um, so we're going to be focusing on um, web APIs, and I think this video gives a pretty good um, understanding of what a web API is doing. Let me know if you guys can like have any audio issues with this video or if you're able to see it properly. Connectivity is an amazing thing. By now, we're all used to the instant connectivity that puts the world at our fingertips. From desktops or devices, we can purchase, post, pin, and pick anything, anywhere. We are connected to the world and each other like never before. But how does it happen? How does data get from here to there? How do different devices and applications connect with each other to allow us to place an order, make a reservation, or book a flight with just a few taps or clicks? The unsung hero of our connected world is the Application Programming Interface, or API. It's the engine under the hood and is behind the scenes that we take for granted but it's what makes possible all the interactivity we've come to expect and rely upon. But exactly what is an API? It's a question everyone asks. Okay, not really, but we're glad you did. The textbook definition goes something like this. In computer programming, an application programming interface, API, is a set of routines, protocols, and tools for those of an API expresses a software component in terms of operations, inputs, outputs, and underlying types. Okay, to speak plainly, an API is the messenger that takes requests and tells a system what you want to do and then returns the response back to you. To give you a familiar example, think of an API as a waiter in a restaurant. Imagine you're sitting at the table with a menu of choices to order from, and the kitchen is the part of the system which order. What's missing is the critical link to communicate your order to the kitchen and deliver your food back to your table. That's where the waiter or API comes in. <clears throat> The waiter is the messenger that takes your request or order and tells the system, in this case, the kitchen, what to do, and then delivers the response back to you, in this case, food. Now that we've whetted your appetite, let's apply this to a real API example. You are probably familiar with the process of searching for airline flights online. Just like at a restaurant, you have a menu of options to choose from, a drop-down menu in this case. You choose a departure city and date, a return city and date cabin class, and other variables, in order to book your flight, you interact with the airline's website to access the airline's database to see if any seats are available on those dates and what the cost might be based on certain variables. But what if you're not using the airline's website, which has direct access to the information? What if you are using an online travel service that aggregates information from many different airlines? The travel service interacts with the airline's API. The API is the interface that, like your helpful waiter, can be asked by that online travel service to get information from the airline system over the internet to book seats, choose meal preferences, or baggage options. It also then takes the airline's response to your request and delivers it right back to the online travel service, which then shows it to you. So now you can see that it's APIs that make it possible for us all to use travel sites. The same goes for all interactions between applications, data, and devices. They all have APIs that allow computers to operate them, and that's what ultimately creates connectivity. So whenever you think of an API, 
just think of it as your waiter running back and forth between applications, databases, and devices to deliver data and create the connectivity that puts the world at our fingertips. And whenever you think. Okay. So I think that gives a pretty good idea. Hold on. I think that gives us a pretty good idea of, you know, the role of the waiter that the API has to connect two servers together or a client and a server together in order to perform different functions. So, oh, my bad. So um, when we talk about web APIs, most of the time we're referring to REST APIs or representational state transfer APIs. Um, this is essentially, you know, just the, the type of protocol that we use um, to pass information from the client uh, and, and the database. Um, so REST APIs are an architecture style for designing networked application. Uh, and they're used to access data from across the web. Um, so with REST APIs, we can retrieve, create, update, or delete resources that are across the web in databases um, that we're able to access through these REST APIs. So um, before we get further into REST APIs, we need to be able to understand um, these topics. And um, first of all, most API, in order for APIs to work, they, there needs to be a specific format that a website is written in. So the first format that we're going to look at is HTML. Some of you might be familiar with HTML. Um, it's pretty straightforward. You, you have, you know, different sections in a website um, that display different information. So you have a, a title, you have, um, you know, your, your body. Where and the, the function of the HTML format is to display information on a web browser. Um, but HTML isn't the only format that's used um, when talking about APIs. We can also use XML format, which is a little different. It's not so visual uh, as HTML. XML stands for extensible markup language, and it's mainly people mainly use XML to make uh, code or the information on a web page more readable for computers as well as humans. So whereas HTML is more just for humans. Uh, XML is, is readable web, uh, for computers as well. So this is one acceptable format that, that is able to uh, give information through APIs. And then finally, a very popular format for APIs is JSON or JSON, uh, JavaScript Object Notation. And this format, as you can see here, it displays information in key value pairs. So this might be something related to a restaurant's API. And um, you can see you have the list of orders, and, with the, and this is the first item on the list. You have the order number, the date of the order, the tracking number, customer ID, and then you have further information about the customer. So it makes it really easy to, to read for humans. Um, it is, it's also very organized and very intuitive. And it, for those reasons, it's, it's a big it's very popular among among API calls to use JSON format because it makes data so much easier to handle. Second, let's talk about HTTP or hypertext transfer protocol. So most of you are familiar with HTTP, maybe not you know in text, but every time you've used a website, you've used HTTP. Um, it's what it does. It's it creates a form of communicating between the client and the server. So HTTP kind of it, it creates documentation that uh, says that a website is legitimate and it gives information about that website. So it gives the header and the body for the website. Um, and it, it allows, it's what allows our computers to be able to access external servers from across the web. So it, furthermore, HTTP can be used to ensure that a website is secure. So I'm sure you've seen HTTPS. Most of the time, work, uh, websites say HTTPS and then the URL. That S means that HTTP has scanned through the website and it, it's, it knows that the website is secure based on what it's seen from the header and the body um, and from previous experience from users, from clients who have accessed that website. So HTTP is pretty straightforward. We've all have have had experience with it. Um, so let's move on. And then the last topic that I want to cover before diving straight into APIs is URIs or uniform resource identifiers. So this the uniform resource identifier gives us 
um, like an address. It's the address for uh, the resource that we want to be able to access. And most of the time, this address is given in the form of a URL uh, or a uniform resource locator. So if we want to look at the UFT website on Wikipedia, the URL gives us the domain, which is Wikipedia, or the root. Then this is the path. So within the wiki, the wiki, which is all the, all the uh, you know wiki sites that we see within the Wikipedia, we find the University of Toronto. So this is the location of the University of Toronto, um, you know, resource within Wikipedia. But um, this this is a resource that we might actually go to if you want to visit a website, but not all URLs lead to an actual website with a proper display. Some URLs are simply, you know, you might go to a URL and find that it's in JSON format. Like all the only thing there is stuff in JSON format. So they literally just has data. It doesn't have anything to display with proper HTML. So, uh, so URLs in the, at the end, they're just a location in, in the web where we're able to access resources. And there's another type of URI called URN, which isn't very helpful for us. All it does is it gives us the name of a resource. So it doesn't actually let us access that resource because it's, it's not so much of a location. It, it's kind of just like saying, this is the name of the resource, but I'm not gonna tell you the path of, uh, to get there. So very important to understand URLs. So with all those things in mind, um, there are website, websites in order to, be, to have their APIs public and uh, available, they need to be restful. That's the term that they use, they're restful. Um, and for them to be restful, as we said, they have to be formatted in either HTML, XML, or JSON. They have to have a URI or a method of identifying a website and its resources. And they have to be, uh, you know, documented under HTTP format. And um, we'll see later on that if a success, if a API is pulled successfully with, within one of these websites, then we'll get an, a status 200. So you might have seen that before, a status 200. You've definitely seen an unsuccessful API pull before. If you have ever typed a URL that for a location that doesn't necessarily exist, maybe the root exists, but if you type, you know, wikipedia.com forward slash, and then just a bunch of gibberish, it's not going to find a website to show you. So it's probably going to give you a 404 status, um, you know, 404 error. Uh, that, that means that the, it can't map the client's URI to a resource, but it might be available in the future. There's also the 400 error, which, which is just in general, it can't map the URI to a resource and it's never going to be able to map it. There's some other 400 errors, errors like 401, which is that you don't have, you're not authorized to see the resource. Um, you know, there's there's a ton of different statuses that you might be able to get, but these are the most common ones. 200, you should be aiming for 200. That means you've successfully accessed the resource. So some example, some examples of RESTful websites or or APIs um, are Spotify. I love Spotify, and um, you know it's very cool that Spotify makes their APIs public because you can access information about songs, information about artists. You can modify your playlists, that type of stuff. So with the Spotify APIs, you can retrieve song info, retrieve user info, create playlists, add songs to playlists, delete playlists, and so much more. Uh, some other examples: use uh, YouTube, Facebook. Uber Eats, um, they, these, these all provide, um, you know, resources that you're able to access through their APIs. So does anyone have any ideas of the type of resources you can access from the Uber Eats API? So what are the types of information that you might be able to retrieve from the Uber Eats API? Yeah, restaurant info, what type of info? Yep, that's definitely one of them. Location, menu, operating hours, yep. Yeah, those are all good ideas. And if you're a programmer and say you want to create a program that automatically sends you, you know, Popeye's chicken every day at 9 p.m., you can use the Uber Eats API to, you know, find a restaurant, find the closest Popeye's to you, and maybe say, okay, if you can't find the Popeye's, find someone else who has fried chicken in their menu. and you know, order fried chicken every day at 9 p.m. You, you can write that program using the Uber Eats API, which I think, I think is very, very cool. So those are some examples of RESTful APIs. So now let's actually try to 
go through the steps of implementing a REST API. So the first thing you need in order to implement an API is to know the endpoint that you're trying to access. So the endpoint is kind of like the URL. It's the location that we're trying to access. Um, um, you know, as I said, resources are usually accessed through URLs. Um, so this is an example. If you're trying to access information about a, a user um, on, on Spotify, this is the endpoint for that user. You know, obviously you'd have to actually put the user ID there, but it, this is the address for all the information that you need about this specific user. With just the endpoint, we're not actually doing anything with uh, that information. We're not retrieving the information. We're not modifying the information in any way. We're simply, this is simply the address. We're not traveling there yet. We just know where it is. Uh, in order to actually access this endpoint, we need to authorize our access. So uh, authorization is not always mandatory. Some, some websites, you know, let you author, uh, access their APIs just freely with, with no authorization to token at all. Some websites charge you in order to access uh, their authorize, uh, to, in order to authorize their APIs. Um, in most cases, uh, from my experience, from what I've seen, you s simply need to authorize a token. So you have to, um, for example, the Spotify API, you need a Spotify account in order to get a token that lets you see, you know, actually access the APIs. So in order to authorize, like I mentioned before, we need a header. And most um, you know, platforms that you're using to uh, access APIs have this space to put information in a header. So the header, it, it verifies the authentication that you're actually verified to access the API. It also, it's a space for you to, to tell, to communicate with the, with the server with regards to what type of content you're trying to extract, if there are any conditions or uh, caching as well. So it, sometimes servers only let you retrieve certain, like a, a, a limit for the amount of information that you receive, like within a certain time period. So this is kind of you, like, you know, saying, telling the server, you know, I'm, I'm authorized to do this. I'm going to make good use of this API. I'm not going to do anything harmful. Um, it, it's, it's for safety more than anything. Um, so yeah, you need a header. So here we have an endpoint, a header, and now we need a body. So most of the time, if you're trying to actually modify something using an API, you want to say like what you're trying to, if, so let's say you, you want to add something into an API, you want to post something. Let's say you want to post um, a song into a playlist. You have to create a body that shows what it is that you're trying to post. So the body is a segment containing the information that you want sent to the server. And the bodies are usually contain this format. So they ha you have to start it off by saying that this is the client URL. So this is like your address, the address of your resources that you're about to send. Um, and then you have to say the URL that you want to send it to. And then again, this is a key value pair kind of in J JSON format of what this resource that you're sending is. So we'll look at some examples to make this a little more clear. Um, but once we have our endpoint and our header and our body, we can actually apply these methods to access the APIs. So yeah, as I said before, here's the location that it's going to, the data that you're sending, and the type of request that you're sending. So once we actually want to apply a method, make the call, um, there are four main types of ways that we do this. Um, there's get methods, post methods, put methods, and delete methods. We'll go over them one by one. Um, and some of them can be used to retrieve data and some of them can be used to modify data. So let's look at the get method first. So the get method allows us only to read data. It doesn't modify the data in any way. Um, and it retrieves data from a, from a server at the specified resource. So let's look at an example. Again, let's look at the Spotify user example. So if we say get, and then we put the, the URL um, or the endpoint, then it's going to give us information at that endpoint. So here I've already been authorized with my account. You know, when I, when I made this um, API call, I had already passed in the header. So it recognizes that I logged in using my account. It already knows what my user, my uh, Spotify ID is. So it displays this information and you might notice 
that this information is in JSON format. So it's a bunch of uh, keys and values. So my display name is my name. Uh, here's some external URLs, how many followers I have, not that many. <laughs> um, if I have any images, um, which I do, my profile picture, here's the URL for my profile picture. Um, and also um, my URI, which is my username again. Uh, uniform resource identifier which is my username so yeah that's pretty cool so we're actually able to start getting information from um, these websites using the the api json um not necessarily i uh, json the main thing about the json is that it's in a dictionary format and then it's kind of the same as a python dictionary if you've ever used a python dictionary um, but the, both the keys and the values are strings, so they can be either double quotes or single quotes. Um, and then another thing you might notice is that there's, there's, you can have dictionaries within the dictionary. So for example, here, external URLs is the key and the value is another dictionary. So the URL for Spotify is this, um, well, in this case, it's only one value within this internal dictionary. But I hope you get what I mean that, um, oh, here, okay, followers, this is the key. And the value for followers is another dictionary. But the hyper reference is none, uh, but the total is 17. So it's, it's a bunch of dictionaries and that, that's what contains the information. So I hope that answered your question. Um, oh, my bad. Let's look at another example. Uh, so, <laughs> Uh, one example that Spotify loves, uh, Spotify loves the song Dance Monkey. And so this is the example that they had. Um, so if you put in this URI and you try to get this URI, um, obviously it had to be the ID for Dance Monkey, but the ID was very long and it makes it look like a bunch of gibberish. So I just wrote here, Dance Monkey. It gives you all this information about uh, that song. So the album, the um, it, the album that it's in, the available markets that it's in, the ID, obviously. It even gives you this really cool information about like popularity, um, the track number within the album. And you can, I, I was looking at this, we'll go over this later. You can even extract like attributes about the song. So Spotify tells you like the danceability of the song, um, the tempo of the song, that type of stuff, which is very cool. It just shows, comes to show like how much information you can actually retrieve from these APIs. So that's the get method, a uh, very popular method if you just wanna get information from a website. Next, let's look at the post method. So this is a write method. So we're no longer just retrieving information, we're actually trying to add information or add data into the resource that we're communicating with. So the post method requests the server to accept an identity as a subordinate of its resources indicated by the URI. So we're taking a resource, our resource, and we're implementing it into the head resource, which is that of the, that the, the uh, we're accessing with the uh, URI. So again, I love the Spotify example. Let's look at an example uh, of posting something into the Spotify playlists. So Spotify actually has, uh, makes it really easy to use APIs, um, which is part of the reason, again, why I love using Spotify API so much. Um, so if you want here to create a playlist, um, we do this using a post method because let's say we have our account, our account information. Part of the information that we have about our, our account is our playlists within that account. So we're taking a new resource and we're adding it, we're creating a new resource within our account playlists uh, dictionary. So all you have to do here um, is add your user ID um, here I put a request body. So this is what's being um, added into the C URL, the client URL. You can see here the C URL post, um, all this information. I made the name of the playlist API demonstration. The description this is a playlist for my API demonstration. I want to make it a public playlist. Um, and this is part of the authorization step that I was telling you about. So this is creating the header. Um, I want, I'm giving, I'm giving Spotify the authority to be able to access and modify my both my public and my private playlists. 
Uh, this is all optional stuff. If you want to be more specific about what you're able to do with these, what you're planning to do with the, this API. So then we request our token. Perfect. We got our token. And then let's try it. So here's the response. Here's Spotify's response. So it's not a collaborative playlist. We could have specified that in the body if we wanted to make it collaborative. Here's exactly what we said, description. Uh, it doesn't have any followers yet because I just made it. It doesn't have any images, but we could have added that as well within the, within the client URL. And yeah, perfect. So let's actually check it out if it actually made it. So if we go into my account, public playlists, there it is, API demonstration. It doesn't have any songs yet because we just made it, but it has the proper name and the proper description. So very cool. Um, that's our first post method. Um, okay, let's move on. Another type of method, by the way, if you guys have any questions at any point, feel free to ask. Um, uh, another method that we're going to look at is the put method. So this is also a write method. And um, what it does, it's kind of like the post method, except we're modifying a resource that already exists. So it's, it's a little more specific in the sense that um, uh, it, it, the types of resources that you can modify varies by like, depending on the app that you're using. So in the example of Spotify, if you want to use the put, um, method, one of the things you can do, one of the resources that exists, uh, Spotify stores the data of whether you're, whether you are or aren't listening to music right now. So you can actually modify that information. You can go from going from the states of not listening to music to listening to music. So let's look at this example. Um, here within the Spotify API, we can start or resume a user's playback. So here I put my device ID, which I got using a get uh, request. Here I, I just, I call this get request user um, api.spotify.com forward slash version one forward slash me forward slash player forward slash devices. That stores the information about the, the um, uh, devices that I've logged in on, that I have logged in right now on my Spotify. And I got, well, right now it's the access is the token expired. So you can see, I got a 401, but before, before I did this, I got my device ID. So I'm giving that to Spotify and I'm telling them, okay, you can change the status for this device ID. Um, I filled in with the sample data. I don't know what song it's going to play, but it's going to play some song. Um, and I'm gonna to have to authorize a new token because my previous one expired. Let's request this token. And then if we try this, hold on. Yeah, okay. See, it's now playing music. It's playing this song by Carly Rae Jepsen. So it changed the status of whether or not I'm listening to music to, okay, resume a song or play a song. And in this case, the sample had, the sample had this song as the song that I'm going to play right now. And it just made me like, in theory, I could create a program that starts playing music whenever I want. And I don't even have to be on that device in order for it to start playing music. So that's another really cool functionality. And again, I, I recommend if you want to do APIs, for example, with a YouTube API, um, the types of stuff you can do with a put function might be very different. You might be able to, be able to play a video or change your status or, you know, it, it varies depending on your account. I think on Instagram, you can use put to, um, to upload Instagram stories and that type of stuff. So again, I recommend exploring the different things you can do depending on what websites uh, you wanna be using their APIs for. So let's move on. And finally, let's look at the delete method. So this removes a resource from a server. And this one is the one that where the header matters the most because you're not gonna just be deleting, you know, Spotify's information from it, from their platform, from their database. It has to be, you know, it has to be very well authorized that, okay, this is my account and I want you to delete something under my name. So again, uh, we've created, we've created this playlist. Let's actually add a song to the playlist first. So here I'm gonna have to authorize this token again. I'm using a post method to add these sample songs uh, to my playlist. So if we try it, this, this is 
I don't know why they confirmed this way. They don't give a status for this call specifically. Um, but this is a confirmation that uh, the call was made success successfully. If we go back, oh, wait, it's because because I made a new playlist, I have to get the playlist ID from here. So there's my playlist ID. And I have to say that I want to add songs to this playlist. So my playlist ID is this. So, okay, let's add songs to this playlist. And there we go, it added these two songs. If you can see here in the, these are the URIs that it's adding to this resource. There's two tracks here. And if we go here, it added two tracks, um, two preludes, I don't know why, but those are the samples and that's pretty cool. It, like we're actually able to start customizing and creating this, this playlist completely from scratch, simply by using code, uh, not even accessing the Spotify user interface at all. So now we just looked at the delete function. Let's actually try it out. So we can use the delete function to remove items from a playlist. So we're gonna need, again, the playlist ID, which by the way, we got from um, the, the server's response to us when we created the ID, it told us the, or when we created the playlist, it gave us the ID that we created. And then let's say we wanna remove one of these tracks. So right here, conveniently, it gave us the track ID. So we, we can say, I wanna remove this specific track. Uh, I'm probably gonna have to get a new token. And yeah, let's try it out. Okay. And there we go, one of the songs disappeared. Um, so yeah, so we, created this playlist that didn't exist before. We gave it a name, we gave it a, a description, we added two songs to it, and now we just deleted a song. So again, the things you can do here are crazy. Is the token function like a key to use the API? Yeah, yeah. So tokens uh, are your form of showing that you're authorized to access this API. So I wouldn't be able to get this token if I did, I, right now I'm logged in with my Spotify account. If I didn't have a Spotify account, I wouldn't be able to get that token. Um, it also, if you can see here, um, it's saying what I'm planning to do with that token uh, or with this API, which is modify public playlists and private playlists. If I, if I said I didn't want to modify public playlists, then it's not going to allow me to do that. So it, it wouldn't allow me to modify this public playlist that I just created. And then you can also add these other scopes, like um, if you want to be a little more specific with what you want to do. Um, you can make it, you know, you can authorize it to do a lot more stuff with your account. So that's, it, you're right, it, it does serve like a key. Um, so yeah, uh, are there any more questions about uh, those HTTP uh, methods? Okay, so there are a lot more HTTP methods. Oh, we got a question. So it allows multiple entries before it expires. Yes, it does. Usually they expire within a, a time limit. And sometimes it's one hour, sometimes it's 24 hours, sometimes it's just like five minutes. But within that time, you can make as many calls as you want. Uh, unless um, that, that API, uh, sometimes they have something called the rate and the rate is the maximum amount of calls you can make uh, within some certain time period. You know, for some APIs, it might be, you, you can't make more than 1000 calls within five minutes, because that, that might show malicious intentions um, or malicious behavior. Um, or it also makes it so that the traffic isn't so you know flooded with, between the server and the client and which might make a website crash. Um, so yeah, but it is, it is within a, a time interval. So here are some other HTTP methods. These ones aren't as popular because they're not as useful as the other ones, uh, but uh, you can call head and that that's another read only method and it retrieves only the head or title of a resource and it's not as much information as the get method. We also have options which returns the supported HTTP methods. So if you want to be able to learn about what are the different API calls that you can make for a, for a resource, you can call options to see, okay, I can get 
and I can put, but I can't, I can't post, uh, for example. And then we can call patch, which updates a partial resource. So partial resources are essentially, you know how I was talking about those embedded dictionaries? So it depends on the API that you're using, but most of the time partial resources are, um, you know, resources that are very well embedded into the main resource, which you would, you know, usually you, were, you would update the resource usually using either a put or a place function. But a patch is for more, you know, the, the smaller details within that resource. Um, okay, so what are some platforms that are used to make API calls? Um, so a very popular platform that makes it very easy to call APIs, and it's actually very similar to this Spotify format that we saw here, where you say whether you want to get when you whether you want to make a get, post, put, or delete call, um, and then you say the URI or the endpoint. You update your header, and then you pretty much get that information. You uh, modify the data, and that's done using Postman. Highly recommended if you want to play with, around with APIs. Can we access the Spotify API using Postman if Spotify needs a token? Yes, because uh, again, with the header, you, you do that all with the header. The header, oh, actually, Spotify also adds another layer of complexity, which um, you have to, let's go to the Spotify API. You have to um, create a client, uh, a client ID and a client password. Let's see. Yeah, you have to create an account and then prepare an environment with a client ID and a client password. They make it really easy for you to do that, but you can't do that like outside of the website. Like you have to do that once initially in order to start using the API from then onwards. That client ID and password never expires. And so that's the type of stuff that might vary between the website that you're accessing information from. Um, also, if, if, for example, if another website requires you to actually pay for their APIs, you're not going to be able to do that through Postman. Um, but all the author, the, most of the authorization part is taken care of with Postman, uh, especially if it's not as complex where you don't have to pay or you don't have to create an account. Uh, Postman is capable of doing that. Um, so yeah, Postman, great platform for accessing APIs. You can also, all your regular programming languages from Python, Java, C Sharp, C++. A lot of them can use um, API, make API calls as well. Uh, most of the time, uh, since most APIs are in JSON format, um, you're going to need the JSON module, which is very straightforward. Um, and then you're going to have to, it's, it gets kind of weird because some of your code is written in, um, you know, let's say you're working with Java. Some of your code is written in, in the Java language, but then your embedded code might be written in, in JavaScript because JSON is pretty much JavaScript notation. Um, but you, you just, all you need is that JSON module and you're able to access APIs using uh, your any ordinary um, coding language. And then um, I put this one separately because it's, it's still uh, any ordinary coding language, JavaScript and Node.js specifically, which is used for backend. But Node.js makes it a little easier considering that JSON is already in JavaScript, um, you know, syntax. So Node.js is another very popular, especially be, again, because Node.js is used a lot for websites. Um, and since it's already in the format, it's used for websites and it's used for backend. Uh, Node.js is another very popular platform used for uh, retrieving APIs. Um, so yeah, but actually before I finish, I wanted to show you guys what some APIs, uh, like messing around with APIs might look like on Python. Um, my personal favorite programming language is Python. So I created this uh, program. Uh, as you can see here, I, I imported these modules. Don't, if, you, if you don't understand everything, don't worry, because a lot of steps have, have yeah, a lot of steps have been taken. Don't, and I personally use a lot of YouTube tutorials to properly understand this. So not everything is so intuitive, but first, you'll notice a very important part, you import JSON. Um, without that, we're not able to make AP, any API calls. So I created this Spotify API object or class where you can look at the different functions that I have, where we get the client credentials. So we're able to, um, uh, yeah, what I was talking about with the Spotify API, you need the client credentials in order to access it. 
uh, that, that's the client's ID and the client secrets. Then uh, the token headers, again, what we talked about before, your authorization. Uh, so this is what goes in the header in order for you to be able to, in order for Spotify to be able to send you a token in response. And then you get that token data right here. And then you actually perform the authorization here. This is very complicated. I personally don't fully understand this, but um, it's very necessary. Without this, we're not able to authorize the our access into the API. Um, we get the access token. The res Okay. And then every time we actually want to access a resource, each resource that we're trying to access needs a header as well. It's not only for that initial authorization. It's also for every future future method that we call in the future. Um, so for each resource that we call, we need the resource header that goes along with it, which is pretty much just showing that we have the access token. Um, and then this is very cool, the actual get resource function. So um, this is the root URI, which is api.spotify.com. The version is usually version one. So that's why the default is set to version one. And then we say what resource type we want. It could be artists, it could be albums, it could be playlists, it could be users. And then the lookup ID, so the actual ID of what we're trying to show. And then th we pretty much went over this right here. So this is the root, this is the version, this is the type of resource we want, and this is the ID, or this is the ID. Um, and so yeah, and from that, we can get the albums by just saying that the resource type is albums. We can get artists, tracks, audio features. That's another really cool thing that Spotify provides, the audio features, like I was saying. We can search for songs, um, and yeah. It's a lot of code and I actually want to show you guys and see if this works. I'm going to run this. Okay, so here's the information that I showed you before about my Spotify user information. And so this is a friends playlist. I'm looking for a friends playlist and I'm extracting the song, the track attributes for each song in his playlist. So it's this huge huge dictionary, but you can see the danceability. So the danceability for each song in this playlist, then the energy for each song in this playlist, uh, the loudness of each song in this play playlist, the mode, which shows whether it's major or minor. So as you can see, there's so much information that you can extract. And I highly recommend, you know, choosing one um, web application that you really want to focus on and discovering how they uh, make their APIs accessible. And then just seeing the different resources that you can extract and whether you can, uh, what type of resources you can post as well. Um, and yeah, that's just, I, I really enjoy the Spotify API. So that's why I chose that one, but it can be anything, pretty much any website you can think of is, is going to have their API 